So everyone, it's two minutes past, so I think now's a good time to start. Thank you, um, everyone who's joined this webinar today, and also anyone who's joined uh, some of the earlier sessions this week. As you might know, we've been running this mental health and wellbeing virtual festival over the last five days. Um, thanks to our supporting partners, Startups uh, Magazine and Workspace. Um, we've had some really, really good feedback. We've had some interesting feedback. And I just wanted to let you know about one piece of interesting feedback I personally received. Um, I think it was yesterday, the day before, when someone dropped me an email, thanked me for the, oh, thanks Shine for the sessions, but also made the point that they'd spotted me wearing the same polo shirt on two of the webinars. Um, so I've taken that on board and I've come with a new polo shirt. So I did a polo shirt to make the point that, um, you know, I don't wear the same clothes every day. Uh, and, and my attendee, or sorry, the panellists are all looking uh, very, very well presented. Um, I'm sure they've given more thought to their opinion appearance than I did earlier in the week. So we are here to discuss uh, mental health in the workplace, especially important at the moment, given um, everything that's going on with the COVID situation, lockdown and working from home. And of course, it's the day before World Mental Health Day, which is tomorrow. So um, I'm going to ask the panellists to, to introduce themselves rather than introduce them. Um, and I'm also just going to ask them, there's one thing I know they've all got in common is that they're all busy people. And I'm going to ask them why, you know, they felt compelled to, to join this today uh, and give up, you know, 45 minutes of their time to discuss this subject. So I'll start with, with Laura. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, lovely to be here. I uh, worked in the music industry for 13 years and um, experienced my own mental health journey uh, while I was at uh, the Royal Albert Hall. And um, as part of that, uh, last year, we founded a, 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 a group called the UK National Arts Wellbeing Collective, which brought together uh, lots of arts, cultural and heritage organisations together just to talk about well-being practices across the industry and the different sectors. Um, and it's just become quite a sort of a really important subject for me. Um, and when the opportunity came up uh, from Matthew to, to join the panel, it was something that I felt was really important to continue those conversations. Um, and particularly at this current time and I think it's it's really high on people's agendas and and something that we could do more to help support each other and open up these conversations uh between us so thank you thanks Laura and just same intro please uh Remy thank you Matthew thanks Laura so I'm Remy I'm a director at Lansons which is a reputation management comp uh, company based in London and we work with um, all sizes of organizations, so FTSE 100 companies to governments to, um, you know, kind of across all different sectors. And we're basically advising on issues which are to do with um, their reputation, but also across society. And I think well being is one of those that we think that all of our clients should be you know, giving a lot of attention to. Um, so today I thought it was a really great idea because it's really important for all businesses of all sizes to think about mental health. I think it's not something it's, that's just for big companies that have got big infrastructures. Um, and, and I think it's time for companies to start listening to people in a way that they never used to. We spend so much of our time at work. We, you know, it's a third of our time at least, and we need to create cultures where people feel like they can be themselves and they can be honest about what they're going through. And I think it's difficult for companies, you know, it's, there's no magic bullet in terms of how do you, how do you respond to people? But as Laura said, right now, I think it's more important than ever before, because we as a company have all been working at home for the last eight months. And I was just saying, some of you might've heard us saying before we started that we're likely to be at home for another six months. And I think this is just gonna pose loads of challenges in itself. And some of them I'm sure we'll touch on in today's discussion, but I think this is a good time to pause and reflect and think about what can we be doing to support our employees in this time and to support each other. Thank you. And Anna, you're up next. 
Sorry, I just had to unmute. Hello, I'm, I'm Anna. I'm the editor of Startups Magazine. So we are an online and print publication that uh, champions tech-based startups. Um, today was important to me um, for a number of reasons. Obviously, the first one is obviously mental health within startups and founders and in the industry in general is really important. Um, a lot of founders suffer burnout. Um, you know, it's something that people kind of dismiss sometimes um, and don't take as seriously as they should do. Um, for me, I mean, personally, and it wasn't until the most, the last few years that I'd really sat and thought about and talked about mental health. Like it's something that was not really spoken about a lot when I was at school. Um, so I'm still learning myself um, and hoping to um, pass the knowledge that I learn on to other people, um, which I think it's important in every industry, but definitely something to focus on within startups and small businesses, um, because, you know, sometimes they don't take it as seriously as they should do. Thanks, Anna. I'm actually going to come on to that point a little later. And over to you, Martin. Thanks, Matthew. So my name is uh, Martin Roberts. So I'm the mental health lead for Lloyds Banking Group, uh, Group Transformation Division, which has about 10,000 colleagues. So exceptionally busy at this moment in time. Uh, the reason why I've come today is really to, I suppose, share some of the stuff that one that we're doing within Lloyds Banking Group. And for me, mental health and well-being has never been as important as it is now. And really how we can try to capture something so negative and dark like the pandemic and change it into something positive as we move forward. And for me personally, I think it's a way of maybe Mother Nature gives that opportunity to reset some of the way we work, practice, and especially some of the messages around mental health and well-being. And also the second reason why I come today is because Matthew and Shine were the first company when I had my own journey two years ago. They were the first company I went to present at, at John Lewis in London to tell about my own personal story and around you know what I was what I did to get my well-being back in the right place. So I owe a lot of debt to Matthew and Shine to giving me that platform two years ago. So that's another reason why I'm here to support this event. Thanks, Martin. Very nice for you to say that. And I remember that um, presentation very, very well, because I know it was one of the first times you'd done it publicly. The first. And the first. Um, I thought it was a second. Uh, maybe you just told me that. Maybe you said you'd had a bit more experience. Um, and I remember being so moved and everyone in, in the room was, weren't they? Um, because, you know, you were very open about what happened um, to yourself and, and the role that Lloyd's played in, in helping you get back on your feet and the recovery. And I wonder then, actually, it could be a good time just to, just to touch on that, um, because I, I want to start by, we we're obviously going to cover the pandemic today and, and lockdown and COVID, but I wondered if, you know, everyone can just talk a little bit about pre-lockdown and maybe, you know, what their businesses were doing um, and, you know, what you got right, what perhaps you didn't get right. Um, because obviously a lot of businesses are very much at the start of a journey when it comes to employee well-being. And I know Lloyd's in particular, very active in this space. So, so I'll stay with you, Martin, and just ask, you know, so pre-lockdown, some of the things that Lloyd's have been doing. So mental health and well-being has always been on uh, the agenda within, especially within group transformation within Lloyd's Banking Group. And within my division, uh, when I came to the role, it was trying to how we can make the agenda, make the discussion more open and try, try to reduce some of that stigma that still existed. And the way we try to adopt is as good as training and courses are, which absolutely, is how we can do things in parallel, things that are more intuitive with engaging with our teams, engaging with our, with our colleagues. So directly, indirectly, they're supporting one, their own mental health and well-being, but also supporting those around them, and it could even be their friends and family. So we looked at what we could do quite differently, uh, and from running choirs to having guest speakers to yoga, meditation, et cetera. Because it's, for me, it's the way we engage with our teams and try to remove some of the taboo that still exists around the mental health and well-being, uh, mental health and the stigma that comes with that. So we looked at, again, how we can try to uh, adapt uh, some, of this, some of the work that we did. And we even adapted the way we met, went from mental health first aiders to mental health advocates and to try to put really some of the spotlight uh, on the agenda, which, to be fair, has probably set us up in a reasonable place as we've now entered the pandemic, and obviously we've had to realign our strategy, our roadmap, as we now go forward into what 20, end of this year, and 2021 uh, will hold for us. And you mentioned there the the, the choir, and I, I believe, uh, do correct me if I'm wrong, that that came about from, from said event with John Lewis, because you yeah. met on, on song there, didn't you? 
It did, absolutely. It was a conversation after that my talk, they said, came up to me and said to me, have you thought about singing in the workplace? Personally, I thought they'd meant about just me singing in the workplace, uh, which they wouldn't want that. Uh, but as a result of that conversation, we uh, came up with the idea of running a choir, not just within the Lloyds Banking Group, but across the whole estate, across the whole UK. And it went from strength to strength. We had at one point 500 colleagues taking part, which then culminated in an end of year performance in London. We recorded a song and video, which has now been released uh, for Proceeds to Mental Health UK. So it's things that were different and it's things that really got the conversation going. But it was more about creating a community around people with similar mental health issues in the past and really coming together to talk about this in an open and a psychologically safe environment to do that. And I think that psychologically safe environment has been something we've really, really taken forward over the beginning of this year. But more and more importantly, it's allowed us to take it forward into what has been a really difficult period over the last six to seven months. So we obviously we just mentioned there the, the, the singing, the song, the music, um, which I think is a good time now to, to bring in Laura because Laura uh, and my paths first crossed when we worked together when, when she was at the Royal Albert Hall, heading up, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, Laura, but heading up the, the wellbeing um, team de department almost there. Is that, that correct? And can you tell us a bit more about you know, the good initiatives that work for you there and maybe a couple of things that perhaps didn't and you had to try and try again yeah definitely so um there was a, a moment once I returned to work after being signed off where I with with anxiety um after having my second son and I'd gone back in full time and it was high pressure working on um big big events in the main auditorium and there were lots of external factors as well. There were lots of um, kind of things happening um, around the UK in the news and stuff. So there was lots happening. And, and, but when I came back into work, I was quite aware that there were other people struggling. As suddenly this sort of, the penny dropped and I realized it wasn't just me. Um, this isn't unusual. In, in fact, it's very common, but everybody was sort of dealing with it in a similar way which was sort of tucking it away hiding not really talking about it um, and as soon as I came back in and started actually sharing my story people started engaging with that and felt more comfortable talking to me about it um, and about what they were going through so um, a few of us very very organically kind of started uh, a well-being committee um, it was more of a wellbeing network. It wasn't even an official thing. Um, and we just started introducing really small sort of events like Zen for 10, doing 10 minute guided meditations in a room. Um, and then started building on that. And we started to meet people, talk to other people, talk to other businesses um, and found opportunities where we could actually bring experts in um, work with Matthew on creating a survey to really understand what our staff were going through, give ourselves a benchmark to work from. And so the group and that team kind of evolved. Um, and I think, I think there was lots of learnings along the way about how we commute out to different teams, whether it was just sort of sharing emails putting notices up um, but actually the thing that really worked was having people walk around the building and engage and we've got a fantastic team now that have taken over leading a, an official committee we've got senior leadership buy-in I talk like I'm still there um, and I think you know the, the the leaders with us today Kasha is doing an amazing job of of actually at the moment considering nobody's really on site at the venue she's created um an ongoing uh sort of program of being able to stay in touch with people who may be furloughed uh who may be working from home not actually be able to get on site to do any of these events in person and has weekly emails going out and and just is continuing that communication which i think has been the biggest driver for us talking about it but actually reaching people through different ways some people will prefer just an email and they'll connect that way other people really value that face-to-face -face contact so 
yeah, I think that answers some of the question. Of course, thank you. And Anna, how's it been at, at startups from pre pre lockdown and the initiatives that you've introduced and the focus on employee well being? Yeah, so um, before lockdown, um, obviously, of course, mental health is a big, as I say, big area in the startups um, community. So we've partnered with quite a few businesses uh, like yourself um, with every um, event. Um, we soon came to realise that um, mental health and, and well-being is a big um area for not just founders for like the whole industry so with every event that we did um we um partnered with open mind well-being um and ash and gabby and they came along well when we were allowed events in person they used to come along to the events with us and at the beginning of every event which some of them i mean they were never intense but you some of them you're talking about sometimes you're talking about different types of funding which can be stressful for people you're talking about um company culture and HR and some serious topics which are really like useful but we had this 10 minutes um like breathing session um and sometimes we had like chair yoga because obviously there's like quite a few people in the room so we we would like do a few exercises that you could do without knocking each other out um and just got people to relax and you know feel that like zen and calmness before the, the storm in, in effect and bombard them with like useful information um but we also had dedicated events that were completely focused on mental health and your health and your well-being and the, the company culture so you know how you as founders can work with your staff or with, work with your co-founders um in a way that is is beneficial for everyone and I think the key thing and um, we're quite a small business ourselves is just being open and having relationships with people that are more than just, you know, work colleagues, which, it, you know, it doesn't work for everyone. Not everyone wants to be your friend, but being in a small business, which a lot of startups are, you do want that kind of like, oh, how was your weekend, you know, and have that like personal side of things as well. So every Friday we used to go out for lunch together um and you wouldn't talk about work like I mean if you wanted to if you really had something urgent that you needed to talk about obviously you could but you you talk about your weekend plans you know you're someone's getting married let's talk about your wedding plans um which no one was forced to come you know if you didn't want to come if that wasn't your thing you you're totally okay to sit that one out but we all went and had this like social element and this open element so it wasn't constant you know corporate 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 there was that other side to people that we kind of got to know each other and so it made it more of a community in us within ourselves um which was obviously hard during the pandemic um but we we kind of kept that going where we had our weekly wednesday zoom meetings to talk about business and then we had the friday social where we all had like a cheeky um drink on friday zoom if we wanted to or you know a bag of chocolate or whatever your thing is um so yeah i think just being open um talking to people on a more personal level um is is something that um that we are quite good at as as a team and you know um good at portraying to startup founders because at the end of the day like startups that is what they are like they want to meet people and they want to be friends and do business and make connections and become a little community in themselves thanks anna and then remy um one thing i know about lansons is the the accolades you've got for for looking after your staff um and it does seem like this culture of staff employee well-being is quite deep rooted within the business so you know can you just expand on that and talk about some of the the initiatives that work and and maybe some that perhaps haven't sure thanks Matthew so uh, we're very lucky because at Lanson's our founders are still within the business you know we've been going for 30 years um but they're the ones who have really helped instill a deep culture of I think it's ultimately kindness, you know, it's the fact that we all do have to respect each other, we spend a lot of time around each other, and it's a company where we've got people across different age groups, where, you know, they have different priorities in their lives at different times, and it's accepting that not everyone is going to want to go out for drinks at five o'clock on a Friday night. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's nice to have a breakfast together, or it's nice just to kind of go out for a walk during the day. So I think there's been a lot of freedom to work how we want to work and to find ways to connect with each other within the organization which has made a big difference um, but also the fact that 
our senior team, you know, all of our senior managers or leaders are all really present. So our chair, chairman, she is very, um, very good at meeting all of our new joiners. So she will have breakfast with them. You know, when, when we were physically in the office, she would take five or six of them out and just get to know them, even though she wouldn't necessarily be working with them because she's not client facing so much anymore. But she would make that effort to kind of give them a sense of this is the culture we have. You know, we care about each other. And she would want to know not only their experience and where they've, why they've come to Lansons, but help them understand what is Lansons. You know, this is, this is the sort of organization that we are. Um, and similarly, our chief executive will meet every new joiner. We're 100 people, uh, but he will make sure that he will. It might not happen in their first week, but it will happen in their first few months. He will take the effort to get to know them and meet them. That, I think, is the type of thing that changes cultures. You know, when you get to know individuals within the organization for themselves and you understand what drives them and what makes them kind of want to be there. That's really important. So a lot of the initiatives that the others have talked about, you know, we have loads of those things in terms of the kind of social elements or the kind of we've got a wellness, to, a well-being team who do lots of things like make sure there's yoga and fruit and, you know, lots of advice that goes out regularly. But we also have some of the more formal stuff. So we have an employee assistant program which offers things like counselling, CBT sessions for people who need it. There's a helpline for legal and financial advice if you need that um, but we also I think one of the things that we've learned to do is recognize that all of our managers have a pastoral role it's kind of giving them a sense of responsibility for the people that they are managing and and making sure that when they have their one-to-ones when they have their meetings that they direct the conversation and they make time to ask people how are you you know, how are you at work, but also how are you outside of work? Because we have to recognize that what's going on in our lives outside of work has a big impact on how we're feeling. Um, and to make time for those conversations, but also to help individuals articulate what it is they want. Because I don't think we should assume that this is the right, you know, we sh I shouldn't assume what's right for someone I need them to tell me how they want the business to respond to them in relation to something and I think that you know we've been on a learning curve through that we've had um, various events in the organization where we've kind of learned from people who have been very open about their mental health um, and, and that's taught us a lot and thanks for, for finishing on that because I, I want to talk very briefly I suppose or get all your opinions on on stigma and maybe just trying to test where we are now with stigma when it comes to talking about mental health so you know some people a lot of people speak about the positives that's come out of this situation we find ourselves in and there are a number and but one I do think is that it has accelerated that conversation you know we are appreciating how people have struggled in lockdown um working from home seemed great at the start but it's increasingly becoming difficult for people um so just to ask you all really in terms of not necessarily in your business um but also maybe in the communities that you're involved in you know particularly laura and anna um what do you feel the stigma is like you know have has it changed are we able to talk a bit more openly we're talking openly about it today but you know in the workplaces in general is it still taboo? My opinion is we are making great strides. Um, and, you know, when we get leadership buy-in and senior management buy-in within companies, and if they're prepared to talk about their mental health, be it in a positive or, or in sometimes a negative light, it does make a huge difference. So I'm going to start with Laura with that one. Yeah, thank you. I think um, I agree. There's There's been a big kind of shift. We're never probably ever going to be completely you know there with it all as with anything it takes it takes time to get people to really understand what it means to them and it means something different to everybody some people haven't experienced the same things that others have um, I think the biggest thing for me is is this conversation this talking this and that comes more naturally to some than others some people don't feel like they want to talk about it some people deal with it uh, much more behind closed doors. Some people have a really great system of, uh, you know, coping with things. Some have experienced, um, you know, big challenges in their lives already and, and they've kind of nailed how to cope with these things when they come up. 
Um, it's different for everybody, but I think sharing how you deal with them is so inspiring. And this, this idea around storytelling is really becoming quite powerful. You know, talking about things that you're happy to talk about and sharing how you've dealt with them. What, what ways have you embraced meditation? For example, it's a scary word to some people. You know, some have tried it, some haven't enjoyed it. Yoga, um, you know, different ways, journaling, gratitude practice, all sorts of things. And for some, it's just cooking, it's crafting, it's something very different, it's football, it's exercise, it's being with other people, um, it's having downtime. And so it, it's like a sweet shop. You can feel really overwhelmed by the whole idea of what mental health is and what well-being is. And this definition means something slightly different to different companies, to different individuals. And it's about people finding their own feet with it. I think, I, you know, within a team, sit and discuss what does it mean to you? What does it look like? Uh, what could the support look like within your team? You know, I think there's always this idea of the three levels of the individual, the team and the organisation. And each of those might have a different approach, but it's understanding where to get the support from, who you can talk to, how you can talk about it, what terminology do I use, um, you know, how do I listen actively to my colleague who's walked in and not isn't looking great today you know what would I want tell people what you would need from them when you come in and you've had a really horrible weekend or something's happened in your family or it's it's trying to crack those little codes that maybe we don't feel so comfortable with kind of talking about and exploring um, and making them you know being uncomfortable with it so that you can be comfortable with it um, so I think, yeah, sort of talking about it, support, knowing where to go, um, it just normalizes the conversation. You know, seeing posters with mental health talk, you know, all over it, it does help because you're getting used to it. It takes people time to see these words and understand what depression means, what anxiety means, have you felt it, have you not? And actually it's not always so scary as it seems on the outside once you start talking about it. Um, and then the more hardcore stuff like reviewing policies, you know, that's where it needs to get a little bit more intricate, a little bit more kind of, is there any mention of mental health in your HR policy? Is there any mention of, you know, what well-being means to this organization? What happens when someone returns to work after being signed off sick? Is it only referencing physical, you know, surgeries? Is it when some a father or a mother comes back after parental leave. There's lots of things that I think can just start moving forward a little bit more so that that filters through the whole culture of an organisation. Thanks, Laura. And Anna, just to, to talk about stigma in the startups community. So I like to you know class our businesses as a startup. And, you know, I do sometimes attend these events back in the, the good old days. And, Something that I always sort of feel a bit uncomfortable with is you mentioned it before. People are trying to get connections and um, you know network a lot, and there's a like it's a fast pace, isn't it? And people you know have to be moving quickly, changing with the times, adapting, being flexible. And let's get your take on it. Do you think that you know if you if you were an entrepreneur, a startup founder in that community? you could say, you know, I'm really struggling with my mental health. Do you, or would it still be seen as a bit taboo and there's a bit of a stigma around it because it just seems a bit, you have to be seen to be being, you know, so, so active and, and involved. Yeah, definitely. Um, we spoke about this recently, uh, Matthew, there's like this pressure on a founder uh, or a co-founder that, you know, you, you have to work, this, you've, de you've dedicated your life now to this business, you've taken the leap, um, you just wanted to succeed with every like ounce of your body so you're going to do whatever you physically can but sometimes you really don't sit back and think you know what am I doing here am I am I going to face burnout am I putting too much pressure on myself am I burning the candle at both ends like you know there's the you need to be able to sit down and just breathe and I think 
recently um the past year or so maybe I've been looking out for it more but um there definitely seems to be a lot more startups and businesses and initiatives in the whole well-being and mental health space because I think people have realized um you know this is an area that sometimes people aren't noticing um traits or aren't even they do notice things but they're like I need to continue you know I need to and this business needs to succeed there's no such thing as failure and they think by maybe talking about their mental health or saying I am struggling a bit here that they're going to fail and they're going to undo undo all the work that they've done for the past so many years and they and they don't want to risk that um but going to events like you said for example and, and networking I've had so many people say um when you go to an event and then they put on like designated networking time or tables where you're forced to talk to people not every founder is an extrovert like some people you know want to just keep themselves to themselves a little bit and yes being a startup is about meeting people and making the connections I'm I'm not saying um it isn't but you don't have to do that there are other ways of meeting people and talking to people it's not just constantly hi what can we do for you like hi take my business card let's meet up and people are constantly like oh let's let's do coffee let's do drinks what if people don't have time to do that like what if they don't have the capacity in their life you don't know what is going on in people's personal lives so I think I think we have come um a certain distance and it has improved um, and people are noticing that especially in the startup world um, it is something to look out for I've spoken to quite a few um, startups that have started like well-being startups or even just like a health tech startup that have a real big focus on uh, mental well-being because they were like I worked in the corporate world for 15 years and then I totally just crushed out like my mental health just went downhill and and I'm not blaming the corporate world like I know um, a lot of things are being done now um but in some ways the startup world needs a lot more work doing but in other ways it is sometimes um a step out of that corporate world that people are really struggling in and then they are kind of succeeding and and taking care of their mental health so there's two really big flip sides to the industry um but I I just don't think there's a right or wrong answer when it comes to mental health is there like we've talked about openness quite a lot and that is obviously one of the the biggest things but like you were saying Laura not everyone wants to be open so it's just kind of gauging what everyone wants and yeah learning learning about people personally because like you say everyone's different. And you're right, Anna, not everyone wants to always network. Those events can be intense. (laughs) So intense. I mean, I love to talk and I sometimes go there and I think, oh, please don't come up to me. Like, I I can't today. Just not today, please. But then you you, you don't want to be seen as like, oh, a bad startup or a bad founder because you're not doing that. So, yeah, it's a tricky balance. It is very tricky. Just before I just move that question on, I'd just like to say to the attendees, uh, we've got the Q&A box open. Um, and I think, as you can tell, you know, we can all talk um, all day about this subject, but I am conscious of time. So if you do have any questions, put them in the Q&A box now and then we can, you know, um, look at that and answer questions. Um, you know, we don't need to wait until the end of the, the session for that. So do please uh, add those if you've got any questions for the panellists. Uh, Martin, I just wanted to ask you about the stigma. Um, Lloyd's, you know, is, is is pioneering in a lot of ways, in my opinion, in terms of, you know, you, you've got internally this great support network that you've talked about, but externally, I mean, to to spend the money you do as a business on advertising and not really talking about the products, but to talk about mental health and mental health awareness is, I think, you know, fantastic kind of get get the words out um to articulate what i think about that um, and 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 how does that impact the stigma within the business i mean you know i'm sure some people as we've talked about don't want to talk about these kind of things but do you think that you know stigma is is low when it comes to, to mental health in lloyds or, or mental ill health i should say I think the the move of stigma is certainly disappearing. I think it's not always the elephant in the room. I think for a number of years, it's always been that elephant in the room that as soon as the word mental health or mental well-being, people have wanted to skirt around it. Uh, but I think given you know our, our chief exec a few years ago came out about his own, his own problems, I think we're now trying to create that environment where we listen differently now to colleagues. 
And I go back to a point that Laura mentioned around colleague stories. That has probably been our biggest success in one, it's, it's real. It gives that credibility and it demonstrates to other colleagues to say that, you know, if this person's going through this, who, through this who you would expect is very open to share their story, then why can't I, you know, that gives me that permission if they need it to actually be a, bit, a little bit more open about their own, their own personal challenges. And for me, it gives a lot more credibility. And, you know, Lloyd's motto is helping Britain prosper. For me, helping colleagues or customers' mental, physical well-being, that's all part and parcel of helping Britain prosper. In fact, it's not just financial, it's also what we do for their well-being, their mental and physical well-being. And, you know, for me, I think COVID has given us this great, great platform, as bad a situation as it be, to really reset some of these words and reset some of the way that we adapt and to, you know, to talk around some of these really, really difficult subjects. And, you know, I think even my role, I go out now and do quite a bit externally, but that's all with the permission of lawyers because it's around collaboration. And if we can collaborate regardless of where we work, it makes no difference. We're all trying to give that same message that it is okay not to be okay. You know, we have times when we find it difficult. Well, that's absolutely fine. And it's just trying to give that message, that give that permission for the people to also take that platform and, you know, get the support that they may need at some time in their future, in their lives or their careers. And maybe just to move that question on to you, just to, to ask about stigma and, you know, how you feel that is at, at Lanterns, but also if we could offer any advice or um, tips on how business that maybe is struggling to overcome a stigma could overcome that. I mean, I completely agree that listening and talking are the two key things. And I think, you know, what the rest of the panel have said in terms of when, when you hear someone talk about something, you see yourself in them. It's the way that you relate to them. And, and that's when you suddenly can see, okay, if it can happen to someone who I think of like me, who I think of as my peer, then it could happen to me. But so, so I think there's something really important on that in that and the businesses that encourage their colleagues to speak and give them the space to be able to speak, the headspace to be able to have that time is really important. But I think second is also listening because businesses need to learn to listen to what their colleagues want. Um, and I think that's the hardest part for businesses because it's a, how do you go about doing that? Um, you know, and, and, and you do that through your one-to-ones, but also there's the kind of the moments in the kitchens when you're having a chat with someone and actually you acknowledge, you recognize that they're not necessarily themselves or how you would sort of see them when they're on top form but what do you do about it you know do you just kind of go on about your day as normal or do you sort of take some responsibility and check in in a different way to make sure that they are okay um so i think the pandemic particularly has taught businesses that they do need to learn to listen you know we i've i've heard lots of organizations say in the last five or six months that they've been doing surveys with their staff about what do you want you know what do you need more of in this time um so, so there's the kind of listening aspect, but then it's like, if you're, if you're gathering all that information, what's the point if you don't do anything with it? So it's then thinking about how do you turn that into some sort of action and making sure you involve the people that you are talking to so that it is right. You know, you, again, it's that point of don't just assume that you know what they want. You know, if they're saying that they are struggling with working from home at the moment, talk to them about what is it that they're going to need to make that feel better. Is it because they've got childcare issues? And if that's the case, then, you know, what do we need to do to kind of adjust your working patterns to support you with that? Or what do we need to do to, I don't know, make sure you've got enough equipment at home. You know, we, we had colleagues where we had to career them laptops or whatever it, because they had children that were using their computers for homeschooling. These are just things that, you know, they're stressful situations when you think I've got to deliver at work, I've got to be trying to teach my child at home. I've got a partner in another room who's also using the Wi-Fi. All of these things are things that now suddenly we do need to talk about and, and think about how do we help our colleagues deal with those issues. Thanks, Remy. Um, I'm just going to open. I've got one question that's come through. Oh, I'm tempted to answer this one myself. Um, the question is, how? thank you, whoever submitted this. How would you recommend convincing an old school senior management team that this is an important aspect of business? How would you recommend getting them on board? 
oh, I want to dive in here, but I'm not because it's not my job to attempt it as I am. Um, so I'm going to ask Laura, if you don't mind, Laura, I'm really putting you on the spot here because we've opened yes, it a little bit now. I can go through it again if you like, but hopefully you got the gist. No, I, yeah, I, I completely hear that question. I think um, uh, it was a big question for us as well. And, um, you know, being all, part of the team that was sort of not at the top, um, knowing that you're you're kind of almost fighting for something feels really difficult. I, I think there are a few things that spring to mind. One is what is it exactly that you're asking of the senior leadership team? Because once you know that, you can start to filter through what information you're taking to them. Um, I was fortunate to have an opportunity to go along to one of their leadership team meetings at the Royal Abbott Hall. Um, so I did a lot of preparation and I brought together a lot of stats and numbers and all sorts of exciting things that I thought was really gonna be useful. And I think it was, I, th I think that did help because it, it kind of connected to them on that level of business. But I also made sure there was a human element and I really spoke to them around the table about, you know, somebody in this room, you're, you're not providing a service for the rest of your organisation. We're talking about mental health and well-being of everybody within this organisation, within this company, you know, people, one in four, somebody around this table, there were 12 of them, there'll be more than one of you around this table going to experience a mental health issue at some point if you haven't already. So trying to speak to them on a human level, so sort of almost removing the business element and talking to them emotionally. Um, and also bringing in some of the statistics which will surprise them. So I did a sort of true or false thing to get them excited about what on earth I was talking about. Um, and, and it was surprising about suicide rates, about all sorts of things, specifically in our sector, specifically in the industry, making them realize that, you know, anxiety is 10 times more likely in the arts industry, all sorts of things. And people sat around the table and were genuine, genuinely surprised because this isn't the sort of world that they're exploring day in, day out. Um, and the other thing was saying, if you don't know what your staff are feeling, you are not going to be able to, you know, drive this business forward. You know, there's a lot of information out there that you're missing. Um, so I think that was quite important and, and did turn a few heads. And actually there was, it was the follow up afterwards. So trying to get in front of people, trying to talk, also having some anchors. So if it's not the person at the very top, talking to individuals, going up to some of the heads of departments, directors, you know, people in between, just spreading the message, getting people to sort of be your sponsor, be an advocate for what you're trying to do around the organization. Um, and actually all it could be is saying to your CEO, saying to somebody, look, have you got a story to tell? We'd really like to share what you do when you're feeling not great or how do you motivate yourself in the morning? Could you share your story? And it could just be a few lines. You could even draft it for them if you know something about them. Is it that they go running at the weekends? Do they have a boat off the Isle of Wight that they do? Is it about being in nature? Is it about reading a specific book? So tapping into sort of smaller elements rather than just saying, I want to improve well-being in the workplace or I want to initiate an initiative on, on mental health and them having this kind of, I don't know what that means. Um, Laura, that's a really good point. Um, I think you mentioned there about sport at the end. So just to finish on this question, we've got a couple more coming in. So this is great. Keep the questions coming in, please, uh, attendees. Um, we did, a, so to half answer this question, even though I said I wasn't going to, but to half answer this, we did a workshop with um, a business. We just started with working with them all around, you know, introducing employee well-being and very top level. But the one thing we encourage and we always do is about senior buy-in, senior management buy-in. And the CEO of this business, um, a housing association, he stood up uh, for about five minutes and he just talked about the role cycling plays in his life. And this was all around mental health. It wasn't about, you know, he'd had a, you know, um, he'd come from a dark place and he recovered. 
it was about mental health and how cycling made him more productive, more energized, just a generally happier person. And he compared it to weekends when he didn't get out on his bike. And then he said he would just feel a bit more sluggish um, and he probably wouldn't be as approachable at work. And it was just a nice way, I thought, to bring in some physical activity to allow people in the room to understand about the relationship between physical health and mental health and to talk about mental health in a positive way. And I think it's very important that we remember that mental health doesn't mean me mental ill health. Um, unfortunately, it does still have that connotation and, and that stigma. So um, having that, we've all talked about stories before, a narrative, and I think if you can have that narrative around mental health and the whole spectrum of mental health can really help in the workplace. And I'm sorry to have like half answered that question, but it's a really good question. And it was a really good answer as well, Laura. I've got one other question. Rimi, I'm going to ask this one to you. So this is from Hazel. She has said, um, how would you advise companies to engage their staff during COVID this time to create a sense of togetherness and team spirit and ensure well-being isn't lost even when everyone is dispersed? And I know that you have been doing some some good initiatives um, during this time. So I thought that was a, one that you know, you'd be happy to answer and advise on. OK, well, we've had um, all sorts of initiatives which have kind of been running over the last six months and a lot of them have just come from people deciding that they want to do things. It's not necessarily sort of someone from HR or someone from the wellbeing team saying, can you set this up? But for example, we've got a colleague who, he loves baking, he's known in the office for always bringing in something on a Monday morning. Um, and, and he decided to sort of turn his baking skills into a way of bringing together a group of people every week just to do a Zoom bake along, you know, where he literally tells everyone, these are the ingredients you'll need in advance. Um, Everyone who wants to kind of join the session does. He talks you through the steps. They have a glass of wine and a chat while they're waiting for it to bake. And, and it's become, you know, it's something that we thought, okay, he might do a few of them, but it, it's been running for weeks. And, and it's become so popular that we now have clients sometimes joining or ex-colleagues popping along. Um, and it's been a nice way of people kind of just coming together for something really informal. It's really not work related at all. And it is just about people catching up over things they like. Um, we've also done things like quizzes, you know, local kind of online quizzes where people have chosen the topics that they're going to be quiz master over. Um, we have encouraged people to make sure they take time off. I think that's a really important thing. That there's something about working at home, which, you know, some people call it living at work at the moment. And and what we're trying to make sure is take time off. And, and there's, you know, the social element that comes through that is that you have something else to talk about when you've taken some time off and you come back and you're sort of feeling refreshed, you can sort of see the bigger picture a bit more. So, you know, we've been saying to people, please try and take a couple of days off a month if you can. Um, and if not, make sure you take a, you know, a good chunk of time off where you're away from the computer. Um, one thing that we particularly found was really important was our parents. We've got a, a large group of parents who've got young families um, and you know, they were really struggling at that sort of initial stage of how do you balance everything. And while we had the kind of pastoral element of HR checking in with them and sort of working out what do we do about your own your own setup, what we also did was set up parent focus groups where we just brought some of them together to talk about how they are dealing with things and sharing their experiences of you know, what's worked and what hasn't worked. And actually kind of what came out of that was a couple of things that they fed back that they just thought would be helpful for us to do as a business, which led to things like blocking out times and diaries where we just tried to avoid putting any internal meetings in and if there was a client meeting then fine there's nothing you can really do about that but internal meetings it's like let's respect each other's time let's accept that people are going to have to do bath time or you know take people to classes or whatever it is um so i think it's a how can you bring people together on a topic where they are going to have something in common but it's not a forced thing you know none of this is something that they feel like they have to do and then we have the weekly bar which is just a zoom bar we've we've still managed to kind of promote people in this period so we're having we're having sort of celebrate in the office we would have had an opportunity where we all came together for a glass of something to congratulate them and, and we don't want to kind of not have any of that anymore so 
um, we will have like a Zoom where everyone pops up and, you know, we have our forum, we have a monthly meeting when we were in the office, which was again, for the whole office to come together. And it was where we talked about what's happening in the business, but where we also celebrated, you know, someone's milestone this month, so-and-so has been with us for 15 years, let's congratulate them. All of that, we've just moved online. And, and actually we, we still do that once a month and we still get, get great attendance at that, but it's also something where it's, again, it's people from across the business who are presenting or talking about things. So you have a chance to see people that you don't necessarily work with on client work. And I think that's the difficulty is at the moment, it's very easy if you just focus on your day-to-day -day job, not to necessarily see the people that you would bump into in the office and, and talking about kind of, you know, the well-being and things that are difficult as well. I think one of the things that we've found hard is, you know, asking someone how they are on a Zoom call is very different to seeing how they are in the office. You know, how are they acting? You can tell when someone's not themselves. And, and having those various touch points where you have four or five people checking in with you during the day. So I think kind of instigating all of those sli slightly sort of softer things that aren't necessarily work related, but you do have an opportunity to talk to people from across the business, your friends, your peer group, your, you know, people who you've always just got on with, but you don't necessarily work with, I think are, are, are great ways of just making sure you maintain that sort of social togetherness. Thank you. That's a brilliant answer. And there's no more questions in the Q&A, but if people are still keen to, to get some answers from our panellists, do um, add to that Q&A box and we'll try and answer them. But I'm going to ask uh, Anna and then Martin just about other businesses, you know, that you've come across, um, you know, in your general day-to-day -day lives or your, within your working communities, who you think that are flourishing when it comes to you know employee well-being or reducing the stigma around mental health and i'll start with you yes so as i was saying earlier there's quite a few um startups um small businesses that are um that the whole business um is you know helping in, uh, bigger businesses or, or startups with their mental health and looking after their employees obviously matthew one brilliant example here um but there and that what you guys are doing is amazing you know opening up the conversation making more people aware of it making more people that it is okay to talk about it um but there was one startup that i recently came across um who they they work in fintech so it's nothing to do specifically with um mental health but they um the the startup's called Pigsby and the founder, Jakob, he basically spoke to his employees. Half the team already worked remotely anyways. And he spoke to the uh, more business focused uh, side of employees and said, you know, what do you guys want? What would work best for you? And a lot of them said that the, the big commute wasn't working for them. They were wasting so much time. Um, it you know it was making them miserable sometimes by doing that long commute in the morning and then having to face it in the evening again so they went completely remote last year before covid which i know speaking about um people have reacted differently to working from home some people were really struggling with it some people are really flourishing with it but he genuinely just spoke to his employees and said what would work best for you and they they gave him the feedback and they said yes you know i think it would be better if we all worked remotely and he said it was one of the best decisions he's ever made and everyone's so much happier the business has um seen more productivity it's progressed it was one of the best decisions he's ever made so i think just that one little story it was in one of our um recent issues um made me think you know he really took the time to just speak to his employees and say okay well what's best for you what would you like and that that really like resonated with me with me and thought made me think um you know sometimes it's just asking a question like you might think it's obvious but if you just ask the question people are going to be honest with you and then that's the best sort of relationship that you're going to have isn't it from boss to colleague or colleague to colleague or whatever so yeah that one really stood out for me Thanks, Anna. And Martin, any other businesses you've been impressed with? Yeah, well, actually, was, time is quite uh, perfect. I was on a call yesterday with a uh, CEO from Unilever from, a, 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 I think it was a mad summit around mental health and well-being. Uh, and on there was the, like I say, CEO from Unilever. And what they've really grasped and really taken forward is that their ethos is if you care for the people, the people will care for your business. 
and they've really created a, a, a place whereby they create that safe environment for colleagues to come forward and say that they need help. And they do not, it's not shone upon as being something that's seen as a negative. They actually embrace that as that seen as a positive thing to do and a, a, a more resilient as well. I think the way that they've really encompassed, I think, the COVID as well and how they've supported their teams and colleagues through it has been phenomenal. And they are now looking at what they call the future fit plan. So as good as we have performance plans in organisations to measure KPIs, measure productivity, but we should also have uh, you know, performance plans around you know, well-being, so mental health and well-being plans. So we can put in place when colleagues and employees need the support because without that, you know, you, you do, you'll never achieve that productivity. So for me, they're really, really taking things forward and really taking the opportunities that COVID is now presenting to really set their business up for, uh, for the future. Yeah, thanks, Martin. And I was I dropped in at Mad World uh, yesterday as well. And I always like uh, hearing from um, Jeff McDonald. Um, and he's actually Unilever, isn't he? No, still he's in, involved with, with their strategy. So I know they're doing a lot of good things. So I'm conscious that we, you know, gone a little bit over time. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any more questions in the Q&A box. But to, to close, I just want to ask each of our panellists um, a little question about tomorrow. And actually, to put you, I'm going to put you on the spot slightly, but I'm sure you'll be OK with this one. So tomorrow, as we know, is, is World Mental Health Day. And I just want to know, what are you doing tomorrow that will benefit your, your mental health? Maybe you haven't even thought about it consciously, but, um, you know, what, what's going to take place tomorrow in your personal lives that, you know, you think will you know, give you a bit of a, a lift and, you know, just generally make you feel happy, positive and good about life. Because, you know, as I say, we talk about mental health often with negative connotations. So I want to just end it on a sort of a positive note. And, and my one is one thing I have missed so much in lockdown um, is live sport and attending uh, live football matches and, uh, Martin is smiling now because he knows that I'm a Man United fan and I wouldn't probably want to go and watch them at the moment. But tomorrow I'm taking my son to watch a Kingstonian, who are like a local lower league team. And they're a lot of fans in their ground, you know, obviously socially distanced and controlled just because the, you know, they will suffer so much financially during this time. So we've got tickets for that. So um, I'm sure, you know, we'll, it'll be a very different experience for us because normally we go to, you know, bigger matches, but really looking forward to that. And I'm sure, you know, we'll both enjoy it. So, so that's what I'm going to do tomorrow on World Mental Health Day for, for my mental health. So, Laura, what are you up to? So, funny you ask, I'm actually going to be uh, delivering a workshop online on my uh, Instagram account, which is Laura Letters Live. And um, I, from moving from the arts, I now uh, create calligraphy and lettering. Um, and as part of that, that all kind of came through my own journey with mental health um, and I discovered creativity as a really mindful way for me to kind of deal and cope with my own mental health issues and it really improves the way I feel. So uh, I wanted to do something tomorrow specifically for other people to kind of engage with how mindful it is. Um, so I'm just doing a little mini workshop in Instagram um, in the morning and then hopefully if the weather's nice heading out um into the into nature as i live in central london uh, heading off to a park somewhere and being near something leafy sounds good thanks laura thanks for sharing Rimi, how about you so, so you've caught me on my last day in the office uh, and and there's something about tomorrow which is just a sort of sense of anticipation because uh, both me and my husband have got a couple of weeks off work where we are literally sort of you know closing the laptops and uh and while there's it's not like there's a huge amount planned there's a kind of sense of anticipation of it's going to be nice to be able to read some books and you know spend some time cooking and have a couple of bottles of wine or whatever it is but there's it's just that that makes me happy that sense of actually I've come to the end of quite an intense and busy period um, and, and I feel like it's kind of perfectly timed that I can now just have a bit of time for me to spend time with people who are important to me and um, just, you know, relax. Oh, sounds good. That me time is, is very much needed, especially now. Thank you. Anna, over to you. 
So um, it was funny earlier when you were saying how um, we need to talk about mental health and not it's not always negative. You know, it's not ill mental health. You know, everyone has mental health. And I hadn't realised, so I started running uh, the beginning of last year to lose weight and to keep fit. And I hadn't realised that um, if you ask my colleagues or my boyfriend, I'm quite an angry person. Um, but when subconsciously, well, I hadn't realised that the days that I go running... I'm less angry. So running for me is obviously a release. And I'd never thought about it. And I'd never thought in my head, oh, I need to go running because it's going to help me and it's going to help my mental health. But obviously, subconsciously, my body needs that. And it is definitely a release for me. Um, so I try and go running every day. So everyone's happy. No, I'm joking. Um, but I do run. Um, I do run in the week um, after work if I'm not too exhausted. But at the weekend, I really look forward to um, trying to not have big plans or try not to be too hungover so I can go on a longer run um, because I just feel really good afterwards. And sometimes I dread going because I'm like, oh, this is going to take an hour out of my day. But afterwards, I just feel so, so amazing that I need to remember that feeling to make me want to go more. And yeah, definitely subconsciously, it really helps my mental health. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that, that feeling after exercise. But I do want to ask you, how angry are you? <laughs> <laughs> Not angry like I wouldn't punch anyone. <laughs> I think, I you're, think... you're an editor and someone's missed a deadline. How angry are you going to get with them? <laughs> what are you doing? No, I'm joking. It, um, just sometimes... Um, really small things that I need to learn to let go really get to me and people closer to me so I'm really really stubborn so it's quite hard but um no it's just it's just the way I am I'm quite OTT and angry but you know I just think you know you learn to love me deal with it <laughs> oh thanks for being honest no I like that and I do like the way that you can appreciate that running can you know have a, such a positive impact definitely Martin the floor is yours. Uh, tomorrow, so family time tomorrow. So my eldest son is a trainee doctor. So he's been on the COVID respiratory ward over in Crew Hospital for the last uh, six weeks. So we've not seen him because then he's had to isolate. So we've got to go spend some time with him tomorrow, uh, with my wife and my youngest son. And just to see how really how he's been managing over the last uh, six weeks, because obviously he's had a tough time. And then just hopefully then go out for a walk and some lunch uh, within the social distancing uh, rules, of course. Sounds nice. It'd be nice to catch up with him after yes. what must have been a very difficult time for him. Thanks, everyone, for sharing uh, what you're up to tomorrow. Um, hope you all have lovely days. And I think we're going to wrap up there. We've not got anything else in the Q&A box, so it does seem like a good time to finish. I know we've gone over um, by quite a bit of time, actually, but I hope everyone really appreciated what we discussed today. And you know, thanks for joining us, and thanks to all our panellists for, for their insights and, and honesty and for sharing things. So thanks everyone. I really enjoyed hosting and hopefully um, see some of you soon. Thanks Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.